All right, let's, uh, let's go to our preaching time. I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15, and we'll begin with two verses there, verses 32 and 33. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 32 and 33. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantageth it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. The Apostle Paul states that Life after death is a reality for the believer. And if not, well, then let's just live it up. A Christian's ultimate goal is to spend eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ in glorified form like he has in order to praise him and enjoy his company forever. Um, and if it means enduring some hardship in this life on the way there, so be it. Um, if there's no future glory to be gained, then just tell yourself, let's eat and drink and hearty, hearty, for tomorrow we die. Why bother trying to do right or live right or worry about what's right? As I said uh, earlier, if there's nothing to be gained for trusting Jesus Christ. If, this, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. There are, there's no reason to live according to any sort of rules uh, or a proper conduct, no rules of right and wrong. Um, do whatever you want. Might as well make the most of it, enjoy, enjoy it while you can, because this is all there is. But then he says in verse 33, be not deceived, Evil communications corrupt good manners. The idea that there is no ultimate uh, consequence to your actions is the problem. Too much uh, familiarity with the unsaved world around you can contaminate you as a believer in Jesus Christ. And the Apostle James warns against this. And he says, he, uh, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. James 4, verse 4. You don't want it to be said of you one day that you had made yourself the enemy of God. There's a lady named Judith Martin. I don't know if her column is still being run, but she was a syndicated columnist, or has been for many, many years, uh, and she's known as Miss Manners in newspapers. And she's made her career giving advice to people about proper uh, conduct, proper etiquette, proper behavior in various uh, social situations, uh, what to wear to a certain event, what not to wear. If you're going to the White House to meet the first family, you don't wear flip-flops and short shorts and so forth and that type of thing. And um, what... Uh, how to, how to set a table, the, how to set a place setting, which fork to use when the salad comes or the main course comes or when the dessert comes, etc. And when you finish eating, do you use the, if you're using a cloth napkin, do you set it on the, on the table or do you leave it on the chair? All of those things are discussed in books of that kind. And uh, these things are classified as etiquette, customs, good form, good behavior, decorum, discretion, discernment, good taste, etc. Um, how to offer a compliment, how to receive a compliment graciously, how to receive a rebuke or a correction without losing your temper along the way, uh, how to break bad news to someone, how to offer a kind word in difficult circumstances to other people and all of those things. And all of this is broadly defined under the heading of manners. And I'm going to get to that today. And I'm certain every society, every culture, have uh, particular rules that govern this kind of thing. And you understand what I'm getting at. Uh, it's commonly understood, and if I'm wrong, then I, I'm ready to be corrected. But if I understand correctly, 
in um, India, you traditionally eat with one hand and tend to personal hygiene with the other. And I won't go into detail. And I imagine in Korean life, it's uh, customs like that. When do we use the good chopsticks for company? When we just when, when can we just use the, the cheap wooden throwaway chopsticks? And you know what I mean. I mean, I don't want to use a spork. I don't like little plastic forks because the tines always break off when you're trying to cut through a, a burrito, you know, <laughs> when you're getting at it. Um, and I don't like using plastic spoons and plastic knives. I like something with some substance to it. But uh, all of things, those things come under the, the general heading of manners. Every parent wants their son or their daughter to behave properly, to develop good conduct and thus good character later on, to be motivated by charity, uh, to have a conscience about doing what's right towards other people. And God, the Heavenly Father, wants the same things of the believer. And he's given us a guidebook, we call it the Bible, as to what traits, what attributes a, a Christian should be known by. What characteristics should he uh, be known by? What habits should he be uh, known by and understood by? Little kids love to laugh about the wrong things, right? Snot, boogers. They like to laugh about beans and what happens when you eat too many of them. They like all those things. And uh, little boys have to be taught to flush the toilet. They have to be taught to pick up after themselves. They have to be taught to wash their hands or to take a bath. If they're not taught, they won't do it. And uh, many grown-ups, likewise, have learned uh, poor manners. We call it bad manners. The truth is they have no manners. But uh, how many of you have ever gotten out of your car at the market and uh, only to discover that somebody emptied their ashtray out in the parking lot? They just dumped it all out there before you step out? Or, uh, or the, we call them diapers. I think the Brits call them nappies. How many like to see a, a rolled up nappy or diaper thrown on the ground when you get out of the car? Because some slob of a parent decided it was more convenient just to toss it on the ground than to find a trash can. But uh, that's a real treat, isn't it, to find one of those? Or an empty beer can or what have you. And so there are a hundred other examples anyone could cite, but I call this mind your manners. Mind your manners today. And what I'm going to give you won't be found in any book on etiquette or proper behavior, but um, what are the qualities, what are the habits that every Christian should be known by, uh, that he should exhibit along the way? Uh, let me have you turn to a number of places today. First of all, go to Luke chapter 1 and verse 9. Luke chapter 1 and verse 9. It says there, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. This was Zacharias, John the Baptist's father. Today, you are said to be a royal priesthood, 1 Peter 2.9. And you are said to offer up spiritual sacrifices, 1 Peter 2.5. And the incense that you burn before God is your prayer. Psalm 141 verse 2 says, Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. So first of all, point number one, uh, good manners mean prayer. They mean prayer for the Christian. Christians should be known for always being ready to pray. King David wrote, Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. Psalm 55, 17. We read, and he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Luke 11, or rather, or rather Luke 18, verse 1. The disciples saw Christ's power when he prayed, and they asked him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. Luke 11, verse 1. And when Jesus taught them, 
he said, but when you pray, use not vain repetition as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. There in Matthew 6, verse 7. And then he said, after this manner, therefore, pray ye. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and so forth. What's come to be known as the Lord's Prayer. But it's interesting in that text, Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, after this manner, therefore, pray ye. He did not say, repeat after me. Ready, begin. And he said, these, these are the, this is the manner of a prayer that you should address to Christ or to God. When you talk to God, these elements should be part of your prayer. To thank him for these things, to beseech him for other things, and so forth. But he didn't say, just repeat these words. In fact, he said, when you pray, don't just say the same thing over and over again. That's what the heathen do. That's what the uh, unsaved do. They think they're going to get God's attention by repeating the same formula over and over again. And they won't. And it's very interesting that the very prayer Jesus said, don't repeat, is the one the Roman Catholics and the Church of England and multiple Protestant denominations insist on repeating. So what does that say about them? Well, it indicates to me that they are classified as the heathen. They think they're going to get God's attention by repeating the same prayer morning and at noon and uh, in the evening. They won't. They're fooling themselves. But a Bible believer should always be able to pray and he never needs a pre-written text in order to pray. Prayer comes from the heart because you actually know God and you can approach his throne uh, as one of his own sons by being regenerated from, by the Holy Spirit. And uh, you secure God's blessings by prayer. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us, 1 John 5, 14. But good manners from the Bible will mean prayer for the Christian. Next, come, if you will, to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. And notice there verse 16. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. It says there, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, so forth and so on. The Lord Jesus was in the habit of going to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. So point number two would seem rather obvious from that text. A good manners for the Christian means supporting the local church. Supporting the local church where the saints are gathered together. The Bible says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Psalm 122 verse 1. That would have been the tabernacle in King David's day. The Bible says, Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thine honor dwelleth. Psalm 26, verse 8. We read in the New Testament, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burden, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Galatians 6, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. John 13, 35. Well, there's no denying the place where all of those things and all of those blessings between Christians originate is where Christians gather together. That's what we call the local church, the local meeting, the local assembly. Uh, it doesn't have to be in a structure called a church building like we enjoy. It could be wherever the saints are gathered together. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. But the main place those things happen in the modern world is in the local assembly, the meeting place. And I've said this to you before many times, and let me it, it bears repeating. If you attended church one hour each week, 52 weeks out of the year, for 70 years, during the course of those 70 years, you never missed a single week. Over a 70-year period, uh, one hour each week, 52 weeks per year, 
after 70 years, you will have given to God a grand total of five months of your life. Five months and seven years spent with the brethren is not very much. One hour a week is not enough. It's not enough. We read in Hebrews 10, verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Some people have very poor manners when it comes to supporting the local work or being with the brethren. But exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. You and I live in perilous times and the bleaker things get, the worse the world becomes, the more you and I need one another's company. I need your fellowship and hopefully you need my fellowship, but we both need to be drawn closer to God with one another. Uh, you cannot be some independent freelance, independent contractor for Jesus. You need to be with Christ established the local church of, of believers in the New Testament. That's where Christians should gather together. And if you can't count on the love and support and the encouragement of other believers regularly, you're going to be adrift on the, the sea of life. The, the world around you is rotten. But good manners from the Bible are going to mean supporting the local church. If Christ was in the habit of going regularly, so should you be. Next, I want you to notice in the same text here, Luke 4, 16, it says, as his custom was, and then it says also, he stood up for to read. And the obvious point number three is good manners will be reading the Bible. Reading the Bible. The Lord Jesus was in the habit of reading the scriptures. Now, uh, before the... Uh, advent of the modern printing press, uh, Gutenberg's printing press in the 1400s, uh, everything was copied by hand, and uh, there would be one copy of the scroll of the, of the scriptures in the synagogue, and the people had to go to the synagogue in order to hear it read, or if they were fortunate enough to be asked to read it directly. But you and I live in a day where each of us own a copy of a Bible we, own our, we hold in our own hands. And if the truth be told, I would imagine everyone here owns at least uh, more than one copy of the Bible. I thank the Lord for that. And uh, I've got a number of uh, Bibles and then a number of modern translations. <laughs> Those aren't Bibles. But, uh, and, and I'm so, you and I should be very grateful that we're fortunate enough to live in a time when we can own a copy of the Bible on our own, of our own. We don't have to go to a church or a synagogue or a temple or a special place and have some authorized representative of God read it to us. And then we take his word for it as to what it means. But you and I are able to read and write and read the scriptures uh, for ourselves and let God speak to us directly. What a wonderful thing that is to have God speak to you directly when you read his book. But... Um, the Lord Jesus was in the habit of reading the Bible. The one who was before all things, the one who created the heaven and the earth, he who was God manifest in the flesh, living among men to identify with the problems of men and the day-to-day -day issues of men face to face. Do you think that the Lord Jesus Christ already knew the scriptures? He had inspired them himself to begin with. He read the scriptures, he studied the scriptures, he concentrated and focused on the scriptures for our benefit, as an example to you and to I. You can't be a real follower of the Lord Jesus Christ without spending time in God's book. You cannot do it. The Bible says, the entrance of thy words give a light, it giveth understanding unto the simple. Psalm 119, verse 130. We read, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Psalm 19, verse 7. We read about the Bereans in Acts chapter 17, verse 11. It says, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Good manners would mean reading the Bible daily. 
not just once a week, not just hearing somebody read it from the pulpit once a week. That's not enough. That's insufficient. Sometimes you hear uh, Roman Catholics refer to themselves as Catholic Christians, and they refer to the rest of us as Bible Christians. And they even admit by those terms that we read the Bible a lot more than they read the Bible. They read it little, uh, very little, if at all. Reading the Bible daily is a good habit to be in. It's good manners. It's good form. It's proper behavior for every true child of God. Uh, it's the custom by which you should be known. Um, if someone says, I'm sure the Bible is very interesting, but I, I'm not really interested in, in reading it myself right now, that person's not saved. That person has never been regenerated by the Holy Spirit where they want more of God. They want as much of God as they can possibly get. You know, when you get a real uh, dose of salvation, you want as much from God as you can get. But mark it down, that person is still on their way to hell. Someone who said, I have no real interest in reading the Bible. I kind of just let my conscience be my guide. That person's lost. Some people, the Bible says, have a conscience that's seared with a hot iron. It no longer guides them and, and instructs them. Your conscience can tell you what's right and wrong. But it's not powerful enough to keep you from doing what's wrong. Now, let's go a little further with the same text. Luke 4.16 states that Christ was in the habit of going to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He went to church, as it were. Uh, and when he went, uh, his custom was also to read the scriptures. He read the Bible. So when he went to the synagogue and read the scriptures... What did he do with it? Verse 15 of that text tells us he was teaching it to them and he taught in their synagogues being glorified of all. Let's read what he did. Verse 17. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now all of that comes from Isaiah 61 verses 1 and 2. But Isaiah 61, verse 2, says to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. Christ stopped reading before he reached the second half of the verse. His first coming and ministry and his second coming and judgment, both in the same verse, separated by a mere comma. In Isaiah's text. The reason he stopped reading where he did was because that particular scripture was not being fulfilled yet that day. And this leads me to point number three. But the text in Luke 4 tells us that it was Christ's custom to go into the synagogue and to do this. And point number uh, four, rather, is good manners for the Christian mean rightly dividing the scriptures. Rightly dividing the scriptures. Knowing what is relevant now, what will be relevant in the future. The Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15. The Bible tells us what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to study. And by the way, do you know the King James Bible is the only Bible that tells the Christian to study? All of the others say, do your best or be diligent. And uh, it tells us to, what we're supposed to do to study. It tells us why we're supposed to study, to not be ashamed and, uh, before him at his coming. And thirdly, it tells us how we're supposed to study, by rightly dividing the word of truth. What applies to you? What applies to, the, to Israel? What applies to somebody in the future? There used to be an old gospel uh, 
Christian chorus. It said, every promise in the book is mine, every chapter, every verse, every line. Nothing could be further from the truth. Not everything in the scriptures was written for you or intended for you. Uh, most of it was written for the nation of Israel to take literally. You and I as Gentile believers uh, are in the body of Christ by adoption. And we draw devotional application from so much of the, the Bible, which the Jew is to take literally for himself as a Jew. And a Bible believer should be known for rightly dividing the word of truth. Isaiah 28 verse 10 tells us that precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Compare the scriptures with the scriptures and let the scriptures interpret the scriptures. I heard a man uh, on a radio program call in and ask uh, Chuck Smith, the, the late uh, founder of Calvary Chapel, when I'm reading my Bible, how do I know which parts may apply to me and which parts might be for Israel or which parts are for the church? And Chuck Smith gave a very feeble answer. He said, well, you know, I don't really worry about those things, you know. And I just sort of enjoy, you know, all of it. And, you know, trust God to work out the details for me. That was a pitiful answer. And uh, it revealed that, that Chuck Smith, although he led a lot of souls to the Lord, and I don't doubt that he loved the Lord Jesus. I don't doubt that at all. But he was a very poor a student of the Word of God. My grandfather, Homer Leonard, I've told you this before, and I'll tell you again. He had a lot more sense than Chuck Smith did. And my grandfather had only gone through the eighth grade back in his youth. We had a, he had a man at his church that was claiming all the promises of God a believer should be able to take. I think all of it applies to the Christian. My grandfather said, what about Luke 131? Thou shalt conceive in thy womb and shall bring forth a son. And thou shalt call his name Jesus. He said, that was a promise to somebody, but it wasn't a promise to you. So good manners from the Bible will mean rightly dividing the scriptures, rightly dividing the Bible. That separates the serious student of the Bible from the casual student of the Bible. And lastly, I want you to turn, if you will, to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. And we'll look there at verses 22, 23, and 24. James 1, verses 22 to 24. It says there, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he, was, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Good manners mean never forgetting what God did for you. Never forgetting what God did for you. He forgave your rotten sins, didn't he? He cleansed you from the guilt of that sin and the shame and the disgrace that you brought because of that sin. He sent the Holy Spirit to live inside your body by faith. He wrote your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. It's recorded in heaven for eternity. He promised to give you an immortal and an incorruptible body just like his resurrected body. And he intercedes between you and the Heavenly Father when you approach God in prayer. He gives hope and he gives help and he gives comfort when your heart is grieving, when your heart is heavy. Uh, he's willing to save other people just like he saved you. And so you and I should never forget what God did for us. This, of course, includes uh, being mindful of the lost being concerned about lost souls. It doesn't mean that you're going to be a great, uh, the greatest soul winner in the world, but you should be mindful that everyone around you is lost too, without Jesus Christ, that God might want to do for them what he did for you. It means being patient with other people, um, patient with new Christians who haven't learned what maybe you've learned yet. Give it time. Be patient. God was patient with you, and he's still patient with you. He was patient with me, and he's still patient with me. 
Bible says charity suffereth long and is kind. The Bible says charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, and so forth. So if God was kind in saving you, if he was gracious in giving you the chance to hear the gospel and to repent of your sins and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, he wants to do that for other people. If God is patient with you, when you read the Bible and you say, I don't understand it, you read it again, I still don't understand it. Uh, in time, those things come as you ask God to show you and reveal himself to you little by little. Begin to understand the, the meaning of the scriptures uh, over time. He's going to be patient. He need, you need to be patient with others as well. And if the Lord has been that patient with you, you and I should be patient with others. And the way to do that is to never forget what God's done for you because he wants to do it for them too. A Christian that only lives to enjoy his own salvation and has no concern for unsaved people is a Christian who exhibits very poor manners as a Christian. The idea that a Christian would be self-centered and occupied only with his own interests and concerns and the things that he enjoys and getting as much out of uh, his Christian life as he can get without giving uh, and being mindful of lost people is a Christian who is disobedient, is a Christian who exhibits poor manners before God and before the brethren. So let's bring this to a close if we can. But mind your manners. Mind your manners. Don't forget the word of God. Don't forget prayer. Don't forget the local church. Don't forget to rightly divide the Bible. Be a serious student of the Bible, not a casual student of the Bible. And don't forget what God has done for you. All of those things constitute good manners from the Bible.